everyone. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Berlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal magazine. As always, that John Rauhouse playing in the background. Thank you for tuning in. I fast tracked this episode. I just said goodbye temporarily to Blake Mills and Chris Wiseman, who are two incredible musicians who are currently working their way down to California. They're playing a show tonight. Tuesday, June 13th at the Tractor Tavern, which is just a hop and a skip from where I am sitting. Then they're going to be playing Portland, then the Bay Area, and then working their way down to L.A. Blake, probably a familiar name to many listeners of this podcast. We've featured him on the cover of our 34th issue of the magazine. He's done numerous video shoots here at the Fretboard Journal for us. He's been on the podcast before he attended our first Fretboard Summit back in 2015. Dear friend of the magazine, he's got a new record out called Jelly Road, which he collaborated with Chris on. And Chris is one of these like under the radar players. So you're going to be meeting him probably for the first time. Really awesome people. I loved hanging out with Blake and his whole entourage. Blake just played with Joni Mitchell at the now famous Gorge Show, her First show in 20 years was here in Washington State last Saturday. Blake was the guitarist up on stage with Joni and has some great Joni stories and actually had a Ken Parker fly guitar here that uh, was brought for that gig. This is what this whole podcast is about, introducing you to interesting people, getting their stories. Maybe you're hearing about them for the first time, maybe you're not, but it's why the Fretboard Journal exists and I can't thank you enough for tuning in. Like I said, Blake's got a new record out called Jelly Road that's going to be out at the end of July. And we, we talk a little bit about this during the interview, we filmed him playing with Chris three songs here at the Fretboard Journal headquarters. Those are going to be going live pretty soon in the next couple of weeks. But first and foremost, the task at hand, I've got a new issue of the Fretboard Journal that needs to get to you all subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, Join us at fretboardjournal.com. Click on the subscribe tab. We also have a digital subscription that you can sign up for that's just $30. These things go a long way towards powering this podcast, the videos that we do. We do not have a ton of advertisers, especially compared to most guitar-related media. I prefer it that way, but the only way it works and the only way I can feed my family and pay my bills is if enough of you decide to subscribe. So please do subscribe to the magazine if you haven't yet. Uh, Be like Blake, be like some of your favorite players out there and get and support this unique little magazine. And if you want to support us in an even bigger way, maybe you've already got the magazine. We have a fretboard summit taking place August 24th to 26th in Chicago at the Old Town School of Folk Music. We just relaunched our website, fretboardsummit.org for that with all new branding and some designs that are going to be on our t-shirts and stuff. Uh, We've also given the full list of the luthiers who are going to be present and the pedal builders and uh, some of the electric guitar builders. We're going to be posting all the artists who are going to be there pretty soon. But let me just tell you, Bill Frizzell, Yorma Kakonin, Tommy Emanuel, Via Mardot, uh, Jeff Parker, a ton of great artists are all coming to our gathering They're going to be sharing their expertise. They're going to be playing for us. They're going to be teaching workshops. It's basically summer camp for guitar fanatics, and it's just $350 for three days. You can stay wherever you want in the greater Chicago area. We wanted to make it uh, affordable, and I guarantee you, you're going to get your uh, three days worth of entertainment out of what we have in store. I just interviewed Allison Brown, the incredible banjo player. She is going to be on, I think, next week's podcast. And Allison plays Deering Banjos, and Deering is sponsoring our podcast once again. If you at all want to mix up your instrumentation game the way Blake Mills has over the years, try something new. Uh, Deering Banjos, great way to start that Deering Good Time series, super affordable, super great way to get into the world of five-string banjo. Peghead Nation is also offering all of you your first month free or $20 off of any annual subscription with the promo code FRETBOARD when you check out. Matt Munisteri, uh, incredible player, another friend of the magazine. Blake and Matt actually played together at that 2015 summit. Uh, Matt's got a new course on Peghead Nation. Everybody should go check out. 
We are also brought to you by our friends at Stringjoy Strings. You can save 10% off of your first order at stringjoy.com with the promo code FRETBOARD when you check out. Last but not least, our friends at Isotope and Native Instruments are having their summer of sound sale. 50% off all software, over 50% off on updates and upgrades. Whether you're mixing or mastering or making new music or fixing old music, there is a solution for you. Uh, I'll include a link in the show notes. This is a great way to get in on their software, which we use, frankly, all too often here at the Fretboard Journal. Those are our big updates. I hope everybody out there is doing well, enjoying the beginning of summer. Again, Blake Mills and Chris Wiseman are on the road right now. I'm talking to you on Tuesday, June 13th, working their way down from Seattle to LA. If there are any Fretboard Journal podcast listeners out there who uh, want to go check them out, I'm sure they would love to meet you. And thanks to everybody on our Instagram and social media page and Truth About Vintage Amps Patreon for submitting some questions for Blake. Tried to get through as many as possible, but you all love Blake a lot and have lots of questions about his playing and his gear. So it would have been about a six-hour podcast and the venue would not have been happy, but we made it work. Thanks, everybody. Till next time. How are you guys doing? What's up, Jason? <laughs> it's been a while. How wild has it been? Well, as I was telling you earlier, I often tell pe- people often ask how long I've been here at this office in Seattle, mm-hmm. and I always say 10 years, but then I realized you were here 13 years ago by looking at the YouTube video with Jessica. Wow. Rue. And so... You were 12 then? Some aspects of me may have been. <laughs> <laughs> 13 years ago. How old were you 13 years ago? Oh, man. Um, I was somewhere in the vicinity of 23. Okay. Wow. I think. I was a kid. It's definitely a kid. Yeah. I had, I had some boyish ways. Nice. Some things to still get out of my system. Hmm. I was on tour with Jessica Hoop. Yeah. Do you remember where we played? You probably played at the tractor where you, Mm. maybe. I can't think of where else you would have. Tractor? Tractor? Good memory. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, it was a fun tour. And that was um, probably not that long after. I remember I performed a song with Jessica, and I think I did a version of, like, It'll All Work Out. Yeah. Yeah, you did. And I feel like that was probably not long after the self-titled record came out. Yeah. You had a uh, a newish Gibson L00, I think. Yeah. I, I'm trying to th- picture the the guitar I played on that. Might have been something I brought from Tony Berg because I didn't have an acoustic with a pickup in it. Yeah. And I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a whole bunch of other guitars and yes. we will get to those. I also did the lazy journalist thing and crowdsourced a bunch of questions for you. But before we get to that, uh, on Saturday, you just played a pretty historic show. Have you come down from, how do you process something like that? You, you played with Joni Mitchell for an epic night. Yes. Um, it was an incredible show. I don't know if um, a lot of the things that happened over the weekend will emerge until we're done with our tour because it was it was a little like we rehearsed um, we we put our duo show together which is like over an hour and a half of music and I have never played that much uh, of my own material or sung for that long and um, and it was a lot of work. Uh, and then I got on stage with Joni and she was up there and she sang for three hours, you know, and uh, it really put things into context of like <laughs> what we're doing compared to, you know, what she's capable of now. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably, once we're, once we're off the hook for our own gigs, um, I probably kind of sit back and and think a little bit harder about uh, everything that that has occurred over the last few weeks. You know, as we got close to that 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 show at the Gorge. Yeah. But um, but one thing that was not lost on me in the moment was how incredible it was to witness this woman 
perform for that long to the caliber that she's still performing at, how much improvisation was occurring right. with her melodies and her singing and, and her range, which has, it's, it's, it's moved over the years it's, and it's continued to move. And so some songs she's inventing a new melody for that's almost like a harmony to the old melody. Um, and she's doing it on the fly. So it was, it was just, uh, it was a remarkable evening and um, we were all just kind of blown away that we saw something and heard some things from her that we had not ever heard before in the rehearsals or yeah. the jams up at her house or anything like that. Like she really kind of was inspired maybe by the crowd and by the evening and just did the thing that musicians do where they, they channel something or they hear something in their mind's ear and it just it came out. It was epic. Even just, yeah, even just watching from a distance, it, like obviously not, you know, just being there in the audience. You know, I saw a lot of the rehearsals, which were insane. And then once it was the actual concert, it was it, it was like definitely like a moment. It was really wild. It was really elevated. Like she was she was just every note, every note, like the exact placement, her pitch. She was just everything was awake. It was mm. incredible. It was incredible. I, I just got literally an email earlier today that they're going to put the record out at the end of July of that. But how much of that show, like how much prep went into that show on your end? Did you know you were going to be playing for three hours? Um, I, I think once we started to add up all the songs that we could do, yeah, um, we looked at it and we're kind of going like, I wonder how long this is actually <laughs> going to be. Because there's stories, you know, yeah. that you, you sort of, um, you a lot time for, but you can't really prepare for. Um, but I would say most of the set was comprised of things that we have played at her house uh, over the last maybe almost two years or something like that. And every time we, we gather and we go up there, um, there's a, maybe a new song. That, that gets introduced or gets thrown in or we'll hear from um, Joni's camp uh, that she's been thinking about a song, you know, wants to try to work it up. And um, and now that she's also playing guitar again, you know, there are some some songs that are coming out of the the woodwork based on um, being things that she wants to play guitar on. Yeah. At the Gorge, there was, um, there was a moment maybe about five minutes before Brandy went on stage to, to play for about an hour as like a, like a warm up set for Joni. And, uh, and like the, it came through the pipeline that Joni wants to learn this other song, you know, a new, a new song, another one. <laughs> and to like, to just ingest and, um, be able to, uh, perform really any Joni Mitchell song in that amount of time is not something I or any, most people are probably capable of doing um, without already knowing it. So we we were kind of rushing around backstage. Everybody was trying to listen on their phones, you know, and, <laughs> and there's no service up there. So we're like, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, um, and so we were thinking about all the different ways that we could say, like, Joni, we really tried to put this together for you last minute, and we just don't, we don't feel comfortable or confident that we're not going to screw it up. And um, however, like Taylor and I, Taylor Goldsmith and I were were um, were working on it a little bit, already having decided that we were going to say, like, we're so sorry, we can't do this. We were we were playing it, and it started to sound pretty good. <laughs> and so we were thinking, like, well, maybe you know, like worst case scenario, we could we could do it like this, you know, a couple of acoustic guitars. Yeah. What was the tune? Facelift. And what's that? What record is that? I think it's on Taming the Tiger. Oh right, right. You told me that. And yeah. it's an incredible song, and um, and the way that Joni plays it. Uh, it, it like once there is a little bit of a simple architecture, like deep, deep, deep down in there. But but I would never have recognized it 
as being that, you know, um, approachable because the way she plays it, it's like, it's very impressionistic uh, almost, you know? Yeah. But yeah, we, we got a passable version of it. Um, and luckily it, like by the time we all got together in Joni's room and started like going through some songs to warm up, um, nobody mentioned it. So we just didn't say anything and mm -hmm. we'll save it for the next one. Um, if she wants to do it, but so there was preparation, but it was not the type of show where we, we had everything like locked out and yeah. we were still like writing down with pencils, like what keys songs ended up in and things like that until sound check that day. Do you just feel like you're in a hallucinatory dream? There's, there have been a number of experiences that I've had over the, the, the last few years that have felt a lot like dreams that I've had yeah. since being a kid. And it's bizarre. Okay. It is definitely strange. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to try to shape some of these questions into some sort of an arc here. Uh, the Old Coast on Instagram says, how am I... Working with regard to Joni Mitchell's catalog, tunings, et cetera, inform or challenge your own approach to this current live format? Has, has learning all those tunes inside and out changed your world? Well, one thing that's really interesting um, is that right around the time that I started playing with Joni was when I came into possession via my good friend Sam Gindel of the Avalon Paradise and um, and the GP10, the Boss GP10. And the coincidence there was that Joni also uses the GP10 with her Parker. Yeah. And it was a solution for her uh, to get around all of the different tunings, uh, as well as finding a guitar that ergonomically suited her. Um, she... She uses the GP10 for all of her, her songs and guitar tunings. So having a familiarity with this, um, this piece of equipment has kind of helped me uh, in that camp assist them as we try moving songs into different keys and transposing. Um, and, uh, and then also getting familiar with, with what is comprising her tone you know the 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 eq and the chorus and all the the the, de the delay and details and stuff like that um have it's definitely uh inspired the way that i use the the, the gp10 the box and we're both using them now on this this tour because um there's something very refreshing about how much you can do with with so little, like not having a big pedal board and, and um, having everything kind of emanate from this source and, and an instrument, um, it, it, it can get pretty big pretty quick. Uh, so that, in that way, it's, it's been kind of a cool yeah. sort of like two roads um, that are being traveled together at the same time. Tunings is definitely another one, like on this record, uh, I think there are a lot of songs in various tunings. And so having this come about uh, at this point in the sort of musical career is also kind of a, a blessing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose Joni's guitar playing has also been a huge influence on, on mine, m more so than ever in the last couple of years since I've been paying closer attention. Yeah. There was a night where she, she had first picked up an electric guitar in a long time. And, and this, this hand hadn't really, I don't want to say it come back yet. Cause she, she could still finger chords and things like that. But what was really incredible was this hand Your right -hand was, technique was really... immediate. Like this hand after not playing for nine years, yeah. this technique was, was, was in there was that I, I was really struck by her watching her right hand technique so she's like strumming with her like thumb 
and her index finger, her hand is held almost classical. Yeah, almost like a bass. It's like, it's, yeah, it's yeah. But I, from what I can tell. No, and definitely not anchored. There's not a lot of strumming with the thumb so much as sometimes it will hit the low string and then but more, more often it's a percussive uh it's like a ghost note yeah yeah it's a stop it was mostly like picking up with her was she doing up and down with her yeah yeah these are totally like free they're like you know tap dancing and is that like a, is that strings. like her technique from all the way back when I think so. I mean, it's as... So look at some... I want to like watch like Shadows and Light again and see what, what that looks I like. I think it's going on there. I yeah. mean, it, it's it's safe to assume that it that there might be songs with picks, you know, way mm-hmm. back in the day. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked, but like, yeah, it's a it's a totally unique way yeah, of awesome. playing, and um, and it's it would be silly to try to learn what it, you know how to do it. Um, when we're playing her songs, so I'm I'm kind of thinking about the the sound that it makes, and and trying to pay uh, respect to that more than the, mm-hmm. the actual way in which she's doing it. Yeah. And before I forget, if anyone's hearing this and wants to hear more on the story of her using the GP10, Fred Wilecki and Isaac Jang did a podcast for us six months ago, mm-hmm. and and talked about. Fred's role in that whole thing and how that evolved, which Amazing. was fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I haven't heard that. I've got to check that out. So, Chris, I want to get your story, but I'm used to seeing Blake with kind of complicated gear. Is yeah. this total fish out of water for you? Definitely fish out of water. Yeah, I'm like very low tech. Okay. Um, yeah, my whole trip, like in Vermont, is is very, very lean. I tend to record on records on things that you're not supposed to record records on. You know, like for years I was like using a cassette four track until that became too annoying. Just trying to, whatever the details of that are, it just like, you know, got harder to get like working four tracks and and tapes that were messed up. So I have like some digital way I'm doing it now. That's like really, yeah, I'm always like avoiding, I have some pedals, but I like, I literally like, even if I'm recording, I don't, I'm usually too lazy to plug them in. So yeah, it is foreign to me, but it's really fun. I mean, it's just fun to be in Blake's world in general. It's like for a lot of really, really obvious reasons, <laughs> um, you know, just musically. But then it's fun to, it's not necessarily my personality to yield, you know, like I tend to be really on my own trip and it's it's fun to to have Blake help me set up sounds that I'm going to play with. Cause I'm technically technologically like just a total idiot. And then, you know, to, to bring those in, it's really fun. Yeah. How did you guys meet? I was introduced to Chris's music via Larry Goldings. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were working on the, the Pino Palladino record and he just said, you've got to hear this guy, which is what I think everybody probably says before blowing somebody's mind with one of Chris's, you know, 5,000 records. And we, we just listened to three or four songs in the studio and it, it made such a big impression on me that, um, I believe through Kyle, I, I got your, our, our mutual friend, Kyle, who's from Vermont and Chris grew up with Kyle uh, Thomas, Kyle Thomas, King tough. Um, he gave me your number because I think I wanted to reach out to you about this, um, this, this job that I got. So I, I was asked to write the music for this TV show, Daisy Jones and the six. And the, the premise was to basically create uh, a band from the seventies that could have existed and, and to write and produce all of their music. Um, and, uh, I said, it, and it was with Amazon and, and it was, you know, it, it was going to be this big TV show. And I said, can I work with anybody that I want? And they said, yeah. And I said, can I work with anybody? And they said, you know, here are the keys. And, and so I called Chris and I said, you don't know me. I'm a big fan of your music. Um, and we have some mutual friends, but I just wonder if 
this idea would appeal to you at all, yeah. you know, and and was kind of ready for a thanks but no thanks, which I had gotten, um, uh, I I'd gotten the, the the impression from just by his reputation of being kind of reclusive, <laughs> reclusive conceptual artist, re, re, yeah, a, a jazz recluse. <laughs> So the, you were saying that is how you are dubbed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just funny because, like, for the, for the first time in basically in my life, you know, there's like a little bit of press like around me. You yeah. know, I've never, I've never, I've been on some tiny labels, uh, mostly self release, never have any PR. You know, so it's just like been, it's actually been really cool to to see the press around Jelly Road and to like see how they describe me. I I I, I don't mind the descriptions. They're just we're just riffing on that because like. It, just watching it develop, you know, it's like jazz recluse. And then it's like, ja- it, there was like one interview I did where somebody wrote in the header that I was a conceptual artist or whatever, just, you know, they meant it um, figuratively. Sure. But now it's like, it, it's like slipped into like almost being a literal thing, you know, anyway, we're just riffing <laughs> on that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no room for lazy journalism with Chris because they can't fall back on something somebody else has said. <laughs> yes. Just like regurgitate it. All right. They really have to yeah. think for a minute. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was on the phone with Chris and explaining this thing to him and, and he was like, this is actually like totally my speed right now, okay. you know, this year, you know, right. It, this, this is totally something I would um, take you up on. So we started working on music primarily for the show and in the process, we're sort of learning each other and each other's tastes. And and um, there was a framework for the show of what was going to work and maybe what would be too outside or, or, or you know, not useful yeah. for the purposes of these characters and stuff. And some of those ideas were still um, – things that fell into that category were still things that were very interesting musically and, um, and intriguing and – I think a lot of the stuff that we ended up working on, um, on on our record that we made together, Jelly Road, is uh, comprised of some of those those early ideas. And certainly, the the practice that we came up with of sort of pen palling is all long distance. Yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. So you never had to go to L.A. No, no, I no, I never went to L.A. Um, until. Um, until about a year ago when we actually were recording yeah. but Blake had actually recorded a bunch before that and we had written a ton before that so it was, and, and I didn't even have a, a phone until the trip to LA <laughs> because I was just resisting you know like I mean it's not like I'm not I don't use it's not like I don't use the internet like I do I'm like everybody whose brains are like deformed from the internet but like I'm not on social media and I, I had, I, you know, I just would like go to the library where there was Wi-Fi and like use my iPad that I also made, mini iPad that I made my records on too, to like, I would li- literally like record songs for Blake on this like iPad mini and then like walk across Brattleboro to, to the library at like, and it would be like two in the morning and stand outside the library and send Blake the music via uh, email, you know, and it would take like forever. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was all that process. And then we basically like, the whole moving into making a solo album for Blake together, writing that together, um, was the, yeah, just exactly the same process. Just the same, it was just a a continuous thing, which was really fun. Do you live in a yurt? No, but my my partner, Ruth Garbus, who's an incredible musician, lived in a yurt when when we first started dating in Guilford, (laughs) Vermont. And, my really good friend Omid Ghadarzi uh, is building a yurt that my band, I'm in a band with him called Intangible Shirt Company. And I think we're going to probably like make a record in a yurt. And I would like to have a yurt. Okay. All right. <laughs> Are you going to be out there is listening. Yeah. For folks who are hearing this and haven't immersed themselves in your music, yeah. like, do you play around Battleboro? Like, is that, do you have a circuit or are you just kind of a home recorder? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I don't play, I don't really play shows that much, but I, I love pl- actually playing live. It's just, you know, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't want to get too like lost in my own trip, but you know, um, yeah, I've just had this thing, I guess the easiest way to say it is just that I've always, 
if I, I this could be like a, a a weakness too, I think, but I've always just done only what the fuck I want to do and like skipped everything that irritated me. So there's just um so I just haven't had a conventional music career. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of things that 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 if they had happened years ago, you know, you might somebody you might be more likely to have heard of me. But I just did it, I just focused on the stuff that I wanted to. Yeah. And yeah, it's made it so that, you know, I'm 40, gonna be 48 at the end of the year. So it's like, and this in a way, this is definitely my highest profile moment with Blake here. But to be honest, the effect on my career, having more visibility, it, you know, it feels great and everything, but it's actually overshadowed by just musically getting to play with this guy. Sure. So, I mean, that's kind of the trip I'm in right now is that, is just the extremely pleasurable high level music that I'm getting to play right now yeah. with Blake. So, and write, you know, but that, you know, we, the making of the record was very focused on writing and recording. And then this has been the first time we've really gotten to just sit down and focus on playing. So that's been just extremely fun. Yeah. And when you go back home to Vermont and work on your own songs, has this affected those? Oh, Blake, Blake absolutely is, is a huge effect. Yeah. I think, I think, I think everything uh, for me, I mean, I do come through jazz and I also literally play, you know, jazz. And I think the, the state of being that's ideal is that everything should affect everything. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's everything is, is, should be sensitive and, uh, resonant and, you know, sympathetic, you know, so I'm sure. Yeah. Very cool. Blake, what's the status of Sound City, which, uh, you've been occupying for a while? We're still there. Mm -hmm. We still record records there every day, work on music every day and, um, love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. we'll, we'll we'll be there for as long as we can and uh it's been a real interesting journey yeah. thus far so year by year basically kind of closer to month by month <laughs> okay yeah. do you do you have a do you have a backup plan no the backup plan is probably like you could make a record anywhere and um the setting the place will have an effect on that process it's not like sound city is is the only place to make an interesting powerful record but it just follows the logic so the the there's something uh, that the building presents and the history of the building and between the sound and um also the environment i think that that we've curated there it's it's sort of a it's an era of that studio's history um, that is unique to, to, to the other, you know, to the, to the legacy of it, um, but is not separate from the legacy of it. So it's, it's just been a really wonderful uh, thing to have uh, had happened for the last five years. And yeah, it's been five years. Yeah. A little over five. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, since I opened the floodgate to floodgates for people to submit questions, Skylar Hale says, I'd love to hear your production philosophies for recording various instruments. Every record he has produced sounds so amazing. And I don't feel like I've heard much talk about the recording process. Oh, um, well, a lot of it has to do with the fellow who's sitting behind you, Joseph Lorge, who's on tour with us. Nice. Yeah. Um, Joseph and I have been working together. Uh, in studios for, uh, what has it been, almost 15 years? Yeah, probably coming up on 12. Okay. So we've learned a lot together um, about what we like. And I think we've also been lucky that on more than a few projects, we've had room to um, to press a little further to try to make something better. Um, I get the feeling that a lot of people who have worked with us are shocked by how much time we'll put into trying to fix a problem. Hmm. If something's distorting or like, um, if something doesn't sound great and 
it's not that we don't also love records where there are things about them or the entirety of the record is like recorded in this way where it, it doesn't sound great. Um, so there's a balance there of like not trying to make it, you know, make something that is pristine or vibeless um, mm-hmm. or too clean. But but I don't think we have to think too much about that because, like I said, we enjoy that. So everything is taste based that we do, and and I think um, the way something is recorded and mixed and and all that is in a lot of ways, an important part of the performance. It's very easy to accept the, the the cliche of like, you know, it really boils down to the performance. And I'd rather have a performance that's good, that's recorded poorly than the other way around. That's obvious. But I think of the recording um, and the, the engineering, the production, the presentation of, of that performance – a lot like the temperature of the food, you know, it's like it can dampen the experience if it's recorded poorly mm-hmm. or if it's mixed poorly. And it doesn't mean that when you serve it to somebody, they're going to say this is terrible. But if it's at the perfect temperature, it's it could be unbelievable, mm-hmm. you know. So that's I think what we're striving for is like is – can it be better? And then once you push past that that point where it's like, no, it was better before, that's that's such a relief, you know, because then you know you have something, yeah, strong. The the role of a producer seems like a kind of nebulous thing, and it's different things to different people. Do you have a a process when an artist approaches you and says like, will you produce my record? In terms of how you get what their ultimate end goal is, I think the. Um, barometer of uh, response to to the demos or to the music probably has a lot to do with a, a feeling of getting that thing yeah. that you're talking about. I mean, it's kind of a clumsy way of saying it, but in other words, um, I, I think by the time we're in a room together working on on that music, it's because there's a sense already of of what they're after. Yeah. Um, and presumably we're at that stage because the artist uh, agrees o- or there's just a perspective that they in- enjoy about another person's take on their music. And that's what they're looking for. I think there's, as you said, there's a lot, there, there's different roles mm-hmm. the producer can play, but, um, but the main one is just trying to, um, intuit what that role is and, um, allow the, an artist to tell you what that is, if they know mm-hmm. what role they want a producer to play on it. Um, the first time I've, I've really had um, somebody who was present to produce me or produce situations in the studio when I was working on a record that I'm the vocalist on mm-hmm. has been the record that we made together. And, and, you put a lot of trust in somebody when you say, you know, okay, I'm going to be the artist and you are going to be the producer and you actually give them room. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a very, you put a lot of faith in their instincts. Yeah. Um, And what I think is so beautiful about that, at least in this experience has been that I, I, I find that it brings more of me out of me not less. Hmm. It's not like in doing that you are necessarily um, depriving you, 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 the, the record, the music of, of you. It's just you're having a conversation with somebody all of a sudden. The conversation is still about the song. You know, it's still about our song. Right. It's still about like my vocal performance or my guitar playing or whatever. It's it's not like at the end of that conversation, I'm going to come out sounding like more like Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've I've been really uh, thinking about how 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 lucky I am to uh, have had that because I, I I there are not a lot of people that I would trust you know mm-hmm. in that situation to to be able to intuit the thing that that I actually think would be good you know. 
Mm. It's such a complicated, just to know what you think is good. is like, that's a full-time job. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, and I'm crazy enough to like, to go into a situation like that where I'm in like this incredibly famous studio with, you know, probably, you know, one of the best record producers in the world and just like somehow have the nerve to just, just like walk around and act crazy and just like say my opinion. So, but, uh, it's definitely, it definitely took something for me to, to trust that situation too, because, you know, it's, it's intense. It's intense. There's just, yeah, I'm sort of beyond, beyond words with it, but yeah, it's an, you know, it's such an honor. It's like, it's hard not to just sound like I'm giving like a, an award speech or something. Cause it's such an honor to work with you mm -hmm. and, uh, to, ha to, ha to have you first of all, sort of perceive me as somebody interesting to even know who I am and then to like, not give a shit about any of this. I mean, it's like, it's like, it seems like you really don't care that, you know, that I'm not, that I'm like not high status or whatever in the, maybe in you know, maybe in some way, you know, being, yeah, it's hard stuff to talk about. It's hard stuff to talk about. But I think the fundamental thing is that it's just been like, you know what? It's probably like what you were asking about the Joni show. Yeah. Actually, like where it was like, have you processed it? And it's like, you know, I, I think I actually sort of haven't really, really processed like working with you. Like, because it, it's, it's sort of, it's, we're still like in like that first wave of it in a way, mm. you know? So it's like, Normally I'm like super verbose and like quick to say something that makes sense, but, or, or not, I guess, but, um, yeah, I'm actually a little at a loss. Do you think that, uh, processing something while you're still in it robs you a little bit of your senses of how to navigate effectively through yeah, something. I do. Yeah, I think so too. I do. I it's like, like it's again, it's the improvisers thing. Yeah. The trip is to be, is to not make a, sorry, I think I've said trip like three times. I had also, yeah, I think I had like three responses to your yurt question too. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> you are a conceptual artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good to not, we talked about this too when we were, when we were trying to like, you know, cause it's, there's so much stuff around putting an album out, particularly one that's going to have PR where, you know, you have to write something about it. And like, we wanted to like do that in a way that was, you know, where we're not being assholes that say nothing, but we're, we're also not just slotting it, giving it, you know, so much of putting an album out is giving it a handle, you know, that people can take hold of. And a lot of times that's very, that's a reduction. And it's like, it, it can, you know, I think we probably used to do it less too. Like if you look back into the 20th century, there was less of that. There was more, like I've thought before, like what was the one sheet for Sgt. Pepper? Was there one? What the fuck did that say? Yeah. You know, so uh, there probably just wasn't one, you know, or, or even for lesser known bands. Well, hang on, I'll Google it. Okay. I've tried, I think I've tried to find <laughs> it. Um, so it's, so it's nice to, yeah, it is nice to ease up on narrative, you know, like what's the narrative? What's the, what's the spin? What's the story? It's like, you know, it's a balancing act. You're like looking for a Goldilocks where you're not just being super um, pretentious and saying nothing at all. Cause there is some story between us, like how, you know, but at the same time you want to leave space. And yeah, I think I'm in a, I think I'm in a state right now where I'm actually trying to do that day to day, you know, just try to, be in the moment and and take it in and enjoy it and and not have too much attachment to like what what does this mean for for what does this mean in the story of my life what does this mean in in the story of my career like it just kind of like i don't know you know it's just like I, it's better to yeah to just feel it and flow with it and uh and and try to actually live it yeah it's very cool uh, we have so many questions. I'm going to try to blaze through some of them because okay. uh, I know you guys got to get to your show. Try to do some short answers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the number one question we get 
for the last month is, you know, what you can't answer is where's my fretboard journal? And it's in the mail to everybody right now. But the second most asked question is, are you G. Weller? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's amazing, like, it's amazing to see people, like, post comments and are like, wow, it sounds very G. Weller. <laughs> oh, know, okay. It's on the other way now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, people, like, um, you know, well, if it's on a post of, like associated with G. Weller's music, it'll be you know, like they'll tag me oh, and say it sounds sure. like me, which I don't think it does. But then, it, yeah, it goes both ways. There'll be something where people are are saying like, like, wow, it's like you know, I can hear the G. Weller in it or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm like no, I think I, I think I shared that album with you. Yeah, kind of early on, um, and. As mentioned in in the interview with Ryan, there's a song, actually that we played today, called mm. "Such Like Horses," um, on the album that G Weller is playing on, and you can very clearly tell the two, mm-hmm. like guitars apart and two guitarists. Okay, it, it's. I think it'll help clarify things because, to this point, nobody's ever heard another musician alongside him so that's true yeah i think it'll be easier to if somebody is listening to this has no clue what we're talking about there was a podcast we did back in april ryan richter did it for us the mystery of g weller and you were on it so go check that out the guitars that you've brought here have Mm -hmm. all been pretty wild can you just give us the rundown of what exactly i'm looking at so um this this guitar is, um, it was made by um, a luthier named Rolf Spuler, who, who passed away. But he, he, I believe, was on a quest to, um, he and his, his uh, uh, building partner, Matthias Graub, were on a quest to make like, the best sounding plug-in acoustic guitar. Um, and I, I believe that not all of them were nylon string. I don't know what the actually the ratio was because because um, there's some steel string players that use them. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's an incredible instrument. Even if you take the the GP10 out of the equation mm-hmm. and um, and the 13 pin cable out of the equation, and just plug a quarter inch cable into it, it can do things that I've never experienced another guitar can do. Um, there's poly sub bass, uh, capability. So, um, for somebody like me, it's, it's really great because you can, you can sort of carve out these bass lines, but they're, they're, it's coming through as a bass, um, very beautifully, very musically. Um, it's, also just kind of a work of art, yeah. you know, visually. Um, and it's just been a joy to play. And uh, I've been using it more and more on everything. Um, I bought it from Sam Gundel, okay. and uh, he met Rolf. And, um, and it was an instrument very near and dear to him. And um, so I think he was happy that it, it could stay in the family. And... Uh, I didn't know it used to belong to Sam. That's really sick. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this, um, the fretless baritone with the sustainiac was uh, made by our mutual friend, Duncan Price. Mm-hmm. And I um, I was playing a, a guitar that I had Reuben Cox build, uh, Reuben from Old Style, um, which Sorry. was a... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, he had come across these very inexpensive um, uh, guitars. Like he got like a, a lot of like twelve for sixty bucks or something. Okay. Like that. And he was just like, <laughs> and they had a piezo in them. So, um, so okay. So Ruben had built these guitars. He said, "What should you know? What should I do with them?" And I said, "Could you make one fretless and um, baritone register?" And. Uh, I think I was using it with an Ebo for a little while as I was kind of pulling away from playing slide guitar. 
and um and and really enjoying that new instrument or that new kind of relationship to the string like being able to kind of ramp in to a note like a like a voice or a wind instrument and um and I somehow came across Duncan's Instagram and I saw that he was building something with a Sustainiac pickup in it and I think it was also fretless at the time and so I just said could you make a baritone you know version of that with a piezo pickup and and some other specs and and that's what he did and he, and he sent it and and then you know finally what that was what was so amazing about that was that rather than with the ebo having such a kind of you're locked into one string at a time um with the sustainiac there's just a little bit more capability to 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 jump across strings and stuff and um and so now i think i've i've had this for two or three years and I've used it on a ton of things. Um, you, you can get a lot of different sounds out of it, but Duncan has developed a, a, a proprietary sort of like hexaphonic sustainer per string thing that, um, that he swears by, you know, yeah. and, and I think it'll solve a lot of the issues that, that the, it, this has with the sustainiac and stuff. Does that require power? Nine volt battery. Yeah. Oh, nine volt battery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so a battery for the Saniac, a battery for the Paizo, and um, and uh, the the new one. I can't recall if he was able to figure out a solution that's not battery, like getting power through the cable. We've yeah. tried a few things, or I should say, he's tried. I've like made suggestions, and he's tried a few things, um, getting power in through the cable, but it like it starts to feed back with the pickup or mm-hmm. kind of squeal and stuff like that. So. Um, it's been a, a journey. It's been a process. Yeah, your your whole gear journey is incredible. I mean, you've the Austin Hooks Filmo sounds, the Rubber Bridge guitar. This one of my questions was like, does this stuff find you, or do you find it? And it sounds like, at least in the case of this guitar, you found Duncan, and he was kind of filling a hole that you were trying to fill. Yeah, I think I think there's a playfulness, like in instrument building and amp building and tinkering in, in general. I think there's a a real joy in the search. And so sometimes when I'm able to meet these people and um, stoke that a little bit with an idea that uh, is, is that comes from a musical conception or or from a player's side, let's say, um, because I'm not I, I'm not very technical uh, on the gear side. Yeah. With, you know, knowing what goes into these or how to make them and stuff like that. Um, I, I think then there's a real, a, a nice partnership, um, simpatico there where, where, uh, it just gives, it, it might give them some energy or some inspiration. And it certainly inspires my playing and the, the sort of like, the, like this instrument, having this instrument has actually altered like the sound that I hear in my head, you know, before playing on something. It's like if I show up to a gig to sit in with somebody, like I will probably bring this before anything else just because you can assume there's another guitar player already there. And at least with this, like I can be expressive in a way and not find myself fighting some kind of a box, you know, some sort of a, a, a sound in my head uh, that that uh, of of things that have already happened like guitarisms and stuff like that this is just a much more pure kind of otherworldly yeah voice every time i've seen you play you do something otherworldly and brilliant you just 20 minutes ago or an hour ago played a song where you sang and played fretless accompanying yourself which just blew my mind like, are you I've never, adjusting your... I've never done it before. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, this is the first time I've I've actually played a song on this and sung. Yeah. Um, he, he, the, you, the, there was no way to know this, but the, the part isn't fixed because I've been practicing this with Blake and it just like, it's always a little different, but you played like a freaking incredible like melody. I think you were still singing the line and this melody came out that was just totally improvised. Mm-hmm. 
the fact that you've only been playing that shit for three years is fucked because the <laughs> it's not like it's not like I can pick that up and like you know like sort of play it a little bit it's like mm. a totally other instrument mm. yeah I mean it's like it, 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 yeah you know you you have like a super talent with like micro pitch stuff and it's that that's the that's the continuity with the slide thing mm-hmm. and it, it comes out in the way you sing too mm. like just micro details of rhythm and pitch and yeah and then you, and then all, the other thing that blew my mind is on the when we we're making the record is Blake is a killer acoustic bass player hmm. like insane intonation so that's related too wow. thanks so since this just happened for the first time are you bringing your voice to where your fingers are on the fretless or are you adjusting your fingers when you're trying to hit a note? Like what, what's getting adjusted when you're playing a fretless guitar and singing? Well, when you are playing with something else that has a fixed pitch, yeah, both are being adjusted. You're tuning to, um, the, the, the fixed pitch. You're both, yeah, both your fingers and your voice are trying to get to that point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they can drift. I mean, like, yeah, if my finger is not in the right spot, it's hard to know what, like, if I'm just playing solo with this, I haven't tried singing and it's probably easier because you can, you can make those adjustments, um, immediately. Yeah. But, uh, I think it's just, just like with slide, like it really, you have to be able to hear well on stage too like if the sound is bad sure it's just you can't even do it you can actually do some real damage (laughs) 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 like it was so lovely one time talking to Derek trucks about like playing slide and knowing that even somebody like him can have a night where just there's something off about the Mm -hmm. sound or the balance on stage and when that's the case you just know like that variable that kind of like plus minus can be like a whole semitone you know what i mean it's (laughs) that's happened to me playing like bass like in like a rock club or something and you realize that you have a string that's a half step flat but your ear is like correcting it yeah it's fucked up shit that happens with that yeah so nightmarish (laughs) yeah uh a lot of these questions that have been submitted from you all have already been answered, I think. But uh, how has sustain in different instruments informed your playing? Does infinite fretless guitar or barely any rubber bridge or right in between normal guitar, cooter caster, make you respond, play, and write differently? That is from someone from Denmark. I think, yes, it, it does certainly make you play differently. But there's... A bit of a chicken and egg thing. I don't know how to answer, which is like, it's it's very similar with um, a bowed instrument. You have the ability to get a staccato sound out of it, or an arco, infinite sustain, yeah, so to speak. And um, and so because the instrument can do has that range, your brain is picking things from that. Like your your what what you want to play on something is inextricably linked to the sounds that you've heard, it, sure. you know, it, that it's capable of making. Okay. So the technique changes quite a bit. And like with fretless, I, I, I realized that the posture of your hand has to be completely different to, to especially if you're playing chords, you know, it, that every, everything that your, your hand has learned how to do, to be more comfortable with frets uh-huh. and little angles and things like that, that the frets right. justify comes through. So you, you do have to kind of learn fingerings for things and a posture for things um, to, to get them to sound in tune. Mm-hmm. And then I think maybe that I took, I've taken that back to fretted instruments a little bit and had maybe more fun with, with a, whatever you call that, that's sort of like um, horizontal vibrato mm-hmm. rather than the, yeah. This thing. Oh, yeah. I think that's like a, I took some lessons from a classical guitar player when I first started. And I think it was, he taught me that horizontal thing. It's like a more of like a side to side wiggle. Yes. You're not actually going up against the string at all. It's that, it's it's like playing how it's sitting in the fret or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's almost very subtle. more of like a phase. Yeah, vibrato or, or you know, uh, so that that has come after the fact for sure. Yeah. Before I get into more technique stuff, you have the third guitar here, the Godan. Yeah, we're borrowing that from our friend Meg Duffy. Okay. And uh, and they're also on a journey with the GP10. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, unlocking its. You're gonna drive up the prices of GP10s. From two fifty <laughs> to three fifty, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's the main reasons we have it uh, are because um, when, as we were doing our sort of Zoom rehearsals in mm-hmm. preparation for this tour, Chris was playing everything on nylon string, right? Yeah, it is sort of. Mm. It's it's always. Been, I grew up with a uh, Giannini like. Guitar. I can't. I don't know the details of like the wood of guitars, but it's like one of the. It might be made of some Brazilian wood that you can't get anymore. It's just like a a very cheap '60s guitar that my belonged to my aunt. Okay. And um, so when I when I started teaching myself guitar, um, I learned on that, and it's sort of yeah, it's not, nylon strings kind of like my my bass. But I don't have like a, a – in college, I used to have one that plugged in and sounded terrible, but that I would like go play cafe jazz gigs with that, with like mm-hmm. a reverb mm-hmm. on and stuff. And so this is kind of a return to that aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's nice though. This instrument is nice and and um, really grateful to Meg, to loaning it to us. Meg is actually roommates with – with uh, they live in a, a nice house on uh, in Mount Washington in L.A. Uh, okay. Kyle's who I stay with when I go to L.A. And Meg – Meg lives in the downstairs of that house, okay. actually. So cool. But um, yeah, and of course, it goes through this pedal. So it's like for little retunings, like Blake just plugged it in, and I just yeah click over to it. It's um, but it's funny when we're playing quiet enough. You might even been picking some of this up today. Like the song "Such Like Horses" has a a string that's dropped a whole step. So there's one string. That it's like has like a ghost note that's a, a whole step sharp. Up. Yeah. Yeah. It gets weird. <laughs> it's interesting. And you can blend the the natural sound of the instrument in with the other tunings. So you can start to it's like having a 12 string, but yeah. it's not limited to octaves. That's wild. Yeah. Ew. So this is the uh you can probably hear that right now. Yeah. Um What am I doing wrong? <laughs> oh, that would be like It's just quiet enough that we're hearing it like that right now. I'm not blending it at all, but probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's wild. It's fun. And you guys are on tour right now, mm-hmm. going down the West Coast, going back home to for you at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to fast track this so folks can find out about that if they haven't already. But um, cool. you're famously known for using Kalamazoo Model 2 amps and all the stuff Austin Hooks has done. Mm-hmm. Are you just going direct with this system right now? Yeah, I think right now, I mean, we've got amps in here to, to hear it. Yeah. But um, yeah, for the most part, like... I'll have a something on stage that's acting like a monitor, yeah, and uh, and then oh. going direct stereo. Out. Those amps we're playing. Uh, this is betraying like my engagement with these details. It's like it's all Joseph and Blake doing this <laughs> stuff. But so those amps, the audience won't even hear those. They're going to hear us direct. That's what Blake. That's what uh, Joseph is mixing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the amps cool. are so mic. the amps are just monitors. Yes. Oh, interesting. I yeah. love that you guys are playing in six hours and you're just discovering this right now. <laughs> it, you know, it could have just as easily been something I never learned about. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go through some of these questions quickly. Um, this is from Thomas J. Holler. Uh, but Blake, you bust out incredibly idiosyncratic and difficult guitar moves. Within your thoughtful long form guitar improvs, I find these improvs and acrobatic moves so satisfying. Similar moves require significant practice on my part to be able to perform them musically. What methods do you use to gain fluency and develop these moves? And how do you practice developing your own harmonic and 
contrapuntal language for improv on the guitar. I don't know, but I do feel like there there have been a number of occasions where I'll like stumble upon something while I'm just playing guitar at the house and and like rehearse it, like practice it thinking, you know, I just need the repetition is what's going to um is is what's going to inscribe it into the lexicon of things that I have to choose from or pull from when I'm improvising or performing. Yep. So often it doesn't. Like there's some other there's some other cache of things that you actually have access to if they're pre, you know things that like you know you know how to do. Like the moves I'm imagining yeah. this person is referring to. Um and I don't have a I don't have a method or a process to like know how to infiltrate that that lexicon and put new things in there. But new stuff's going in there all the time. Yeah, new stuff ends up in there. But you don't know how. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, where do your ideas come from? Yeah, you know, it, it does. It is kind of a mysterious thing, and the reality is like. As an improvisatory musician, from night to night, in place to place, I, I have varying levels of access to the things that feel like me. Yeah. You know, right? Like there's that whole can of worms. So, you know, in the best environment, like on the best night, on a full moon, you know, it's the Wolfman saying the full moon and an empty stomach. <laughs> championships can be won. Uh, they're they're what ends up happening is you make, and I heard you use this term and it's, it's so spot on. Like you can make these connections, you know, where, um, something very simple that maybe all of us as guitar players know, like some sort of a shape or scale or, a, um, a lick or something like that. When you can rewire it and repurpose it and mm-hmm. use it in a different context, um, and it seems to come from nowhere, like it, it, like your hand does it before your brain understands why. That's that's the the kind of thing that comes to my mind um, when that person was describing in their question, like mm-hmm. the, that a move, you know, something idiosyncratic like that. W- one of the coolest things uh, of late on Instagram is watching young players and not so young players try to attempt some of your songs and you've done an incredible job of like fostering that sharing those walking people through the process like um skeletons walking is the song that everybody's heard now Mm -hmm. from the next record do you remember how that came to be well that guitar part was something that chris sent to me and it was a line that that he sent and i think it started on the E flat chord. I don't think it had to pick up. It didn't. So he sent that to me and I wrote uh, some things to it, hearing it in a different key than he had originally you know, intended for that, or heard that line in. We hear it in two different keys. And the, the trick is, is that I can't hear it in Blake's key and he can't hear it in mine. Well, I can hear it in yours. You do the pomp and circumstance yeah. trick. Yeah. yeah. Which is like my favorite song, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, it's Larry Goldings, I think. I heard him play it. Really? Yeah. He it, That song is incredible. It's so beautiful. It's actually in, uh, I rewatched Clockwork Orange recently and it was in there. Um, yeah. So that was cool. My One thing I really love about that song is that we, um, I was... Uh, it was like a few days before I came to LA, like most of the album was written and I sent you a few just quick ideas and I, I made up that little looping, that guitar part, which I think is pretty much that. And then, and then Blake says, it's just sent me back. I think the same day, I think I have something for this. Cause I think you had written those lyrics without any music. Or you, you might've sat down and wrote them, but I felt like you might've had that. Mu- those lyrics are, I can't it, recall. But the, it was right away that the whole thing, yeah. you just sent it back singing the whole thing. Yeah, it was quick. Yeah. And then in the studio, we did some cool stuff too. I mean, Wendy Melvoin came in and played rhythm guitar on that. That was 
very insane for me because I'm an enormous fan of the classic period of the revolution, particularly the relationship between Lisa Coleman, Wendy Melvoin, Prince, and Susan Rogers too. Mm-hmm. Like that, that, that crew is just like the Beatles. That's the Beatles of Prince to me is those four. But um, so just, and then, yeah, I played some of this horn that I played today yeah. is, on, yeah. is on skeleton. I think that might be the only, oh no, I'm playing the guitar part with you. We're doubling yeah. it yeah. together. But then, uh, yeah, and then we rewrote the horn part together and put yeah. it on. And it's been really fun to have that song come out. And then, of course, the freaking guitar solo is like pretty good. Chris was yeah. instrumental, yeah, I so. uh, no pun intended, in, in getting guitar solos uh, on this record. He was very um, insistent yeah. um, that, that there was expression through that instrument and uh and i i struggled with it a little bit and then uh i think that song was the was the breakthrough for me like as a as a player on the album um to feel comfortable like with the idea of uh of, of yeah being more seen you know as a yeah. guitarist on a solo record i mean uh, yeah i i I, re- I read the pitchfork review of mutable set which i had I think I heard it might have. I can't remember if that review came out on the day the album came out. I didn't hear the album until it came out, mm-hmm. so I got to like we were working together, but I got to hear that that album is unbelievable to me. I love that album so much. Um, and the Pitchfork review had something like, basically, kind of like that punk thing of like, you know, the intelligent person like is like above guitar solos, and they were complimenting you for having the restraint to to not solo very much. I think they were like, you know, he's a virtuoso, but you know, of course he's so tasteful that and and I mean it's true like that any any good guitar player like has to have restraint at exactly the right time. And the restraint on that album was exactly the right time. But I was like, you're not gonna let them fucking say that again. Like there's gonna be <laughs> guitar solos on this next album. I didn't even think we were making it together yet. Mm-mm. I was already just like, Blake, your next guitar album is gonna have solos all over that fucking thing. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's just, it, it, I mean, that's just, it's such a gift to to hear that flower fully. Mm. And um, yeah, you might have resisted it until you heard the, your own playback of your solo on that song. You yeah. know, once you heard that, you're like, you know, it might be you, but you're not going to be able to, to deny that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very beautiful. Uh, well, thank you for pushing through you, my resistance. Yeah. Well, the the world can thank me for it. <laughs> just just to appeal to the gearheads, what actually are we hearing when we hear that solo on that? This- Okay, it's yeah. that. Yeah. With any effects or through any amp of note? Well, I, I don't think it was through an amp. I think we were probably doing some combination of, um, you know, gain from the, the board. Yeah. Plugging straight into the console and um, and maybe some, some pedals, but I don't remember what we used. I think we had a couple things yeah. on the ground and we're probably trying some stuff. You played slide on top of it for a second. Yes, I think that yeah, is, I I think that is grab, comped in for a second. I, I did I, grab a slide <laughs> and uh, try to do, and then there was a capo. Yeah. Oh, was there? Yeah. There's for a capo. folks listening to this, we're talking about the Duncan Price yeah. fretless yeah, guitar. Yeah, fretless guitar. So there was a capo, uh, probably for the whole solo. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think there was because I mean I have to go back and listen and see, but. Um, I think there was a capo like up on the eighth fret, mm. and um, and I was playing it in in G, you know, like thinking about it in G. Right in an open tuning. No, in the in standard. In standard. A yes, lot of that slide was slide in standard was kind of new for me. Right. I yeah. I it, a lot of that though was one performance. Like I I remember I was like one thing that's interesting about you when you're when you and joseph are working and and like you don't do that thing of like lighting the candles and turning turning the lights down or whatever it's like some of the most important things that happen like the the most uh vulnerable moments like your vocals your guitar solos you you guys just like 
just do it. Like, you, you know, you were like crouching, you were, you were like crouching on the floor the whole time you, mm-hmm. you were playing that solo. It was almost like you, you guys are like really smart at like not realizing what you're doing or something, not, not, not letting yourself get stuck thinking like, this is going to be important. Mm-hmm. Like you just like fucking do it. Like it was like, I was like walking around the studio while you were playing that solo it was like there wasn't any uh, it was like there was no ritual mm. and i was like walking by and i was like i was like oh he's taking the solo he's doing it now and i and i heard what you were doing and i was like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> no comment <laughs> You guys are uh, working your way down the coastline, getting back to L.A. Are you going to tour beyond that, beyond this little stretch you got here? I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's a way to do it. Yeah. Touring's really expensive now. Yeah. So I, I think so. Um, this is my final tour, actually. I probably never yeah. tour again. Yeah. You I haven't mean, even played a show yet. Well, it's, it, it's because it's actually going so well. That's, oh. why, I, that's why I have to stop now. It's because it's been like, yeah, we haven't played a show yet, but it's been like the most fun. Like Julian is like such a genius of like every, every step of the day is like yeah. brilliant. Yeah. We're like hanging with Gabby, Joe. It's like five of us. And it's just like my friend Ellie McAfee Han told me like when I left, they were like, um, you know, like you don't have to do this again. Like you can just do the best version of something because I was super nervous. Like I don't mm-hmm. travel much. Ellie's like, you don't have to do this again. You can just do the ideal version of a tour and then just never do it again. But you you might be able to convince me of something more. Mm-hmm. But I Well, haven't. I think of each one as the, the same way that you do. It's like, yeah. it's going to be the last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm glad I had a small role in making your Sunday enjoyable in the mountains. Oh, my you God. You guys were commendable. Yeah. That was... You guys were up till like 3 a.m. with Joni Mitchell. And then I asked you to meet me in like the most re- remote part of the Cascade Mountains imaginable. And you somehow rallied and were there at like noon. It's all credit goes to my <laughs> wife, Gabby, because um, she she held out as long as I did at the, at the gig and the after party and everything. And, and that following day was actually her birthday. Mm-hmm. And oh, I think yeah. she was – subtly hinting to me that she sort of just wanted to sleep in sure <laughs> and, totally reasonable and i played dumb and was like i you know when julian makes a schedule i just <laughs> i don't really stray from it and we'll be fine yeah you know so yeah we, we were on uh we were a little sleep deprived but um as soon as we got into the mountains and smelled the air and, yeah and got to that property it was um it it all subsided. It's stunning. It was a great day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was fun. So uh, lots of Australians want you to go visit Australia and tour, just cool. so you know. Um, Gabby, you're here in the room. Somebody's asking, Blake, how has fatherhood influenced, affected your relationship to your work and creativity? Do, <laughs> do you have some explaining to do or? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <laughs> uh, That's fake news, whoever yeah, posted I wonder, that. Well, a lot of people have um assumed that uh if i'm unworthy is about parenthood oh yeah hmm. yeah so i've I, I know a lot of new fathers or young young dads who um who have have uh, t- gotten that from that song mm-hmm. i can see that yeah uh a lot of questions here kind of all asking the same thing when and you kind of went over this what do you do when you sit down to study? Like, is there one guitar that you tend to pull out? Is there just whatever's on the rack or next to the couch? Yeah, I think I think having a guitar that is um, that is not I would I was gonna say it's not precious to you, but like it really doesn't actually matter. I think certain guitars just have seasons like there's there's some guitars that come into your life and, yeah. and they they they're the perfect guitar for you at that moment and it makes you play more some guitars that i have owned have definitely had periods of time where they feel like they've fallen out of season a little bit whether it's set up or yeah. where i'm at i'm just not as drawn to them um so it's it's a moving target okay. a little bit 
Um, and then also what music you're inspired to sit down and work on, whether it's original stuff or you want to deconstruct, you know, a, 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 somebody else's playing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's helpful to have a, an instrument that's similar. And sometimes it's actually better to like, if, if I wanted to like, what is, you know, West Montgomery doing here? It's kind of nice that all I have at the house is an nylon string. Yeah. Mm. It keeps, keeps it in perspective. All right. In a cool way. Cool. I know you guys got to go uh, sound check and stuff. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. It's been great. Cool. Pleasure. All right. That was my conversation with Chris Wiseman and Blake Mills talking about Jelly Road, talking about their tour, talking about Joni Mitchell and so much more. If you like this podcast and you've already subscribed or already thought about coming to the Fritboard Summit, the uh, simplest way to help me out is just share it with your friends on social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you use these days, Twitter. Uh, podcasts can be a little hard to find, and it's great when people actually take the time to share them and point them out to their like-minded friends and guitar fanatics. So with that out of the way, we will chat again next week. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. <laughs>